Hello. Um, okay, uh, we're going to talk about um, stateful workloads and containers. And I made this catchy title to get you in this room, but actually I have way more funny things to do because we have a lot of fun with Monkey Island today. But first of all, um, my name is Johannes. I used to work for Mesosphere, um, the company behind um, the Apache Mesos, or the main contributors to the Apache Mesos project, and also the main responsibility for DCS, the data operating, um, data center operating system. And the demo is based on this stack. But it doesn't mean that all this stuff I'm going to tell you in the next 30-ish minutes are only about DCS. I think they're more general about running state, stateful um, content in containers. Currently, I'm working for Neo4j. Um, it's quite interesting because we're our database company and we're running stuff in containers happily. And I'm working in the cloud project. So if you go to neo4j.com slash cloud, um, you see our managed data source um, solution. You can check it out and, and see what, what I'm doing all day long. So you can find me on Twitter if you have more questions afterwards and, or want to say that don't like Monkey Island. I don't know why someone would not like Monkey Island. Anyways. Uh, first of all, let's start with you. So who is running stateless stuff in containers? Okay, just a few hands. Uh, who have used containers in the past? Okay, great. Who have used containers for databases? Okay, three, four. Who's running containers in production? Okay, who's running databases in containers in production? Oh, great. Um, Let's try it afterwards, please. Uh, so one hand is uh, obviously knowing all, most of the stuff I'm going to tell you. But before we start with that, I tell you a story you're probably really familiar with because this is a microservice conference. So we move from here, like MS Paint, Windows, laptop, the, the old days where we built applications, to more modern stuff like the internet. You got remote uh, connections, and then you realized well, this is not going to scale if I only have one box to add in more boxes. And then you thought, well, okay, this is a mess. My application on top of that is too big. I need to cut it down. And then I really, I know everyone hates the term service-oriented architecture, but it's basically like the fundamentals of what we're doing now is like we're cutting things based on um, separation of concerns. We're building smaller systems based on this. But then we introduced automated infrastructure, like we're doing with self-provisioning more servers, so nobody know, uh, needs to uh, bring service to our data center, so we have someone who's going to do this for us. At least I hope you have someone who's doing this for you. And then we started the craze of microservices, so we're building really small sets of applications who are sensible in their own, and then we're aggregating bigger systems based on smaller services. And this was inherent with the race of Docker. So Docker was really popular, or is really popular, since 2014, uh, and they made a, a great accelerator for the container movement, and, and for Croc as well. Um, so they built really nice tools, infrastructure tools, like the Docker registry. So I'm able to, I'm going to skip this, um, so they're building really nice tools for registry. So I can build a tarball on my laptop, I can push it to the registry, and every one of you can run it on your on your laptops, on your staging environments, on your production environments. And this is, this is great. You can build images self-contained with all the dependencies packed in this table and everyone can run it. So Docker was a reach, uh, huge accelerator. But that also made our picture a little bit more complicated. So we have a new layer inside our stack. So we don't have MS Paint, Windows, laptop anymore. We have something like this. But actually, this is a lie. So uh, if someone attended some talks from me, uh, you'd know the next slides, but this is really, really important. Just adding a Docker uh, container runtime, it needn't, uh, doesn't need to be a Docker runtime. Adding a container runtime to your stack alone it won't help you. You need more things. You need to think about more things. So when you're talking about containers in production, you need to talk about container scheduling. So where to start your container at what, at what time and place, and on which host. So you need to think about how to handle scaling. So do you want to start all your applications on one host? If you're doing machine learning, well, maybe. But if you're doing a web shop, this is probably a bad idea, because when this host crashes, your online shop, your tool to sell value 
is, is gone. So you want to separate your containers, maybe. And if one container fails, maybe you want to start it somewhere else, or maybe you want to start it on this exact host again to leverage um, existing data on this node. So you need to think about that. And you need to think about resource management. You need to think about limiting your Docker container or whatever container you're running. Like this example is pretty bad because the container reuses all the resources the host provides. So you want to limit the resources of your container. You want to limit the CPU consumption, the memory consumption, um, the disk consumption, or maybe nowadays the GPU consumptions as well if you're thinking about machine learning. And you want to think about service management. So all your containers in all your fancy ships need to travel in more or less the same direction. And you need to think about service discovery, dependencies in your application trees, and all these kind of things. And when we're talking about these three topics, we're talking about orchestration. And I really love ships, but we're actually we're talking about this. So we need to talk about, in the scheduling track, about placement, where to start, what, in which point of time. We need to think about deployments. Do we want to do rolling deployments, canary deployments, blue-green ones, how to do co-location? So some applications want to be co-located on the same hosts than others. So you need to think about that. On the resource management, I think this is pretty straightforward. You want to limit your container so in any dimension. CPU, memory, disk, GPU, IP, ports, everything a container can consume, you want to limit to um, multiplex your multiple containers on one host. And in service management, service management, you need to think about dependencies. So please start my microservices or my one service after the data store was successfully started and is passing a health check how to do load balancing, service discovery, and all that kind of stuff. And again, now we have this picture. So actually, we have these kind of stack. So all the traditional stuff is more or less a little, little bit shrink together, and we have something like this. So the orchestration layer in our application is, is quite big. And if you're putting containers in production, you need to think about orchestrating them. Just put something in containers. Don't make it any better. I know... Docker is really popular, everyone loves Docker, but just using Docker won't solve your problems, really. And just using Kubernetes without thinking about it won't solve your problems. The same is true for DCS. So just because DCS is on my t-shirt um, won't solve your problems. So distributed systems are hard, and they will keep being hard, even though you're using more modern technology who's trying to extract some of those um, complexity. They're still hard, you need still need to think about this complexity and still made the complexity present to you. Okay, but we're not alone. Meanwhile, our whole data uh, landscape was evolving as well. So when you ask Mrs. for you see probably get a, a picture like this about modern um, technology stack, and they call it the smack stack. And it's quite, actually I like it, because you have um, more uh, wider use of, of, the, of technology. So what you usually have in, in these kind of high event-driven applications, you have a, a ton of events. Like imagine a, a banking software. So every time you use your credit card, your debit card, or pay something online or, or on PayPal or whatever, you trigger events. And all those events goes to the first uh, ingest no, or the first ingest technology to queue up all the events so that someone can translate those unstructured events to a more structured way and put it to Cassandra, for example, the storage. And then you can do some, uh, extract some more higher level, high graded information out of this, for example, using a MapReduce technology like Spark. And then you can do some fancy analysis and maybe decide that when I want to use my credit card, that this is maybe fraud and the, the cashier should ask for my ID to prove that this is not fraud. Um, so you can leverage more data tools nowadays. And then you can, they call it the smack stack because it's um, Spark, Mesos, Akka, Cassandra, and Kafka. But you can exchange any of those technologies, but today we want to focus on, on the data stores. Because when we look at current data stores, you have a great choose. So you can, it's, it's not the days anymore where you can, need to choose between Oracle 7, 8, and 9. <laughs> Someone is laughing. Um, you can choose the data store who suits your problem the best. 
and who's making less pain in implementing your problems and solving your problems. And maybe you need to choose two or three. And you can order those data stores. So if you go from relational key, uh, stores to key value stores, maybe a graph store. I think graph is a great choice. <laughs> uh, document store, time series stores, files, or search stores. You can choose the data store technology which fits your problem the best. And maybe you need two. And now we're making, again, a, a little quick poll. So when we start a new project tomorrow and think about your ops team or the ops team of your customer. And we are thinking about, well, we want to use a Cassandra cluster, a Neo4j cluster, a Couchbase cluster, and an Elasticsearch cluster. And we want to start engineering on Tuesday. Will your ops team be amazed by this request? Or are you going to be hunted with some guns or something like this? So. Who's going to be hunted and thrown out of their office? Why do you have an ops team? Why do you have an ops team? Ah, because maybe you're forced to have an ops team. Uh, maybe you're not in the shiny world of Amazon only or something like this. Maybe you have an ops team, maybe your customer has an ops team. Um, maybe you, you are not in this kind of nice situation where you can leverage a, a managed Kubernetes in GKE or something like this. So maybe you need to. Um, I need to, or I needed to. So yeah, I, I would be thrown out. <laughs> and I think this one is the ops guy. Uh, so anyways, uh, uh, let, let's talk about the, the modern data center. So before I joined Mesosphere, I worked for, for German companies, and we did like, big enterprise software for, for big German customers. And before we started a project, we did a, a proper sizing. So we thought about, okay, this service probably needs this amount of... of resources, and we need four database instances, and we need a little bit Kafka, Cassandra Kafka, probably not in that dice, but imagine. Um, so we get uh, to the conclusion that we need 50 nodes in total for our application. And we decide that the red part is for microservices, maybe around 20 nodes. And now imagine you're an online shop, and you're selling shoes, and it's 5 p.m., Everyone comes from home and wants to order shoes. So your microservices are probably under heavy load. And now imagine you lose 20% of your nodes. This is pretty bad. Because probably you Cassandra or Spark is idling at the time because they have a different load peak, a different load peak over the day. So it would be really nice to move the purple nodes to the red ones and help the microservices to solve the workload to generate value to, to keep production running. But we can't because we static partitioned our cluster. And the same is true like for, for different load uh, peaks. So when you static partition, so you're not able to move around applications between nodes, you need to optimize every subcluster against load peaks and load peaks of a different point of point of time of the day. So you're wasting a lot of resources over the day. So it would be really great if you could do something like this. Like we have one set of resources, one big pool of resources, and the application who's needing resources is just picking CPUs and memory, and we don't bother about where this is started as long as it fits in the, in the, general, um, in the general state of our overall application. And this was the point where Apache Mesos comes into the game. So a, a short history about Mesos. So Mesos is, or was invented in 2009 by one of the founders of Mesosphere with two colleagues at the UC Berkeley. And they researched in their PhD, see this, about fine-grained resource sharing within one cluster between different applications. And this was the time where Twitter has these cra crazy scaling issues. So Twitter was not able to add more service to their data centers um, versus they got new users. And Ben knows someone at Twitter, and he gave a tech talk there. Twitter really liked that. They pushed the implementation forward. Um, they published a source code draft of this the same year, entered Apache Incubator, then entered Apache, a top-level project at uh, Twitter, is running completely, like the Twitter production is running on Mesos. So it's over 30,000 node cluster. And so this, this is in production in really big 
installation. So uh, if you check Netflix, so the entire Netflix streaming engine is done in Mesos as well. So these are not small clusters, they are more the, the, the bigger ones and also the data-driven ones. Um, the great thing about Mesos is it's, it's really flexible. So actually it's a two-level scheduling. And we have two kind of nodes in the cluster. I don't think you can read this, but it doesn't matter. So the red ones are agents. And agents are designed to run workload, to run databases, to run Java services, to run node services, just to run any kind of service. Doesn't, doesn't matter if it's in Docker or not wrapped in Docker. And on the other hand, you have Mesos Masters. And the master is a, is a coordinator. And the master takes care that the resources of the agents are distributed fairly, so on the fair uh, share algorithm, between all registered so-called schedulers. So this agent, for example, is holding four CPUs, 20 gigabytes of memory, and the agent offers those resources to the cluster, and the Mesos master decides which, uh, which scheduler is going to get uh, the offer. And on the other side, you get schedulers. By, so if you look at these US, you get, a, um, you get Marathon. It's a generic kind of container orchestration framework who is able to re, uh, receive and consume Mesos offers. But on, alongside this container orchestration, you can have a Spark scheduler who's, who's able to schedule Spark jobs or a Kafka scheduler, or Cassandra, or Elasticsearch, or a Kubernetes scheduler. So if you don't like Marathon, I don't know why you don't like Marathon. I worked on this project. <laughs> no, anyways. So if you don't like Marathon as container orchestration framework, you could choose Kubernetes for your microservices. But on the other side, you are able to choose um, the Spark or Kafka scheduler to run your other workloads. And this separation of handling resources, like a big resource negotiation framework in Mesos, and the business log logic to decide where, where and when to start which container is extracted of this. And this was made on purpose because it's way different from scheduling stateless workloads to scheduling databases. So let's have a look at... Oh, Cassandra is not on this picture. So let's have a look at Cassandra. So when you want to scale down a Cassandra cluster, you want to pick one node out of the cluster. This is really special. You, so you need to treat this node you want to uh, extract from the cluster really special. You need to um, make some calls, then wait some time, and then shut it down. And this is, the, this is very special. So you, it's, not, it's not feasible to do this in Marathon, for example, or in the other generic scheduler. So this is why um, this separation was done. And you can easily write your own scheduler. So there's an SDK. You can um, have a generic description in YAML. And if you want to have specific lifecycle events handled differently, you just hook in Java code. So this is really nice. OK. But when talking about stateful workloads, we need to talk about data. And in general, we see three different kinds of applications nowadays, more or less three different kinds. So we see stateless applications, like everything you put, put in a Tomcat, like software containers, um, or an Nginx, or something that serves services. So sure, they're producing logs, but in the best case, they're not producing business-relevant data. And for those applications, it's OK to get them at a sandbox. And when the container stops, you will clean up the sandbox somewhere in time. And then you have stateful workloads, like on, 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 the, uh, on the lower uh, side of this picture. And then you have traditional data stores, or data stores that was designed for distributed computing. So if you're talking about traditional data stores like Postgres or MySQL, without the clustering extensions, so without Galdera and all that stuff they build on top of those, you're forced to do backups. Sure, for the other database, as long as your backup fits your data center, if you're talking about big Cassandra cluster, that's not always the case. But if you can do a backup for, for Couchbase or Cassandra, please do a backup. But for those, you don't have a chance. You need to do backups. Or you want to use external like network-attached storage. This is pretty bad for a database when the storage is distributed. So write requests become really, really expensive. But if you want to have a hot failover, 
with those single instance databases, you probably don't have the big choice. Anyways, if you have a data store that is designed to be distributed, which, which an inbuilt replication, you probably don't want to have replication on, on this layer as well, because you have, um, you have replication on two layers. It's one, one uh, replication too much. So for those applications, there's a concept called local persistency in the Mesos world. And with this concept, you get place on your local disk, and you get a label on those, on those, um, those disk space. And if you shut down your container because you want to do maintenance and upgrade or it crushes, you're able to restart the replacement container on exactly the same data again. And this is great, because when you restart an elastic search node, for example, uh, because you want to do an upgrade, a minor version upgrade for this node, you get the same data back, and elastic search can decide on its own if it wants to replicate only the last five minutes where the container was down, or if the elastic search um, container wants to replicate all data since the beginning of this cluster. So in the best case, you gain a lot of performance um, because you prevent full data replication for your data stores. Okay, so now do DCS. Wait, this works in both directions? <sighs> I really love the game, I'm so sorry. Um, so this is, DC this is DCS, and it's exactly what I just told you. So in DCS, you have the uh, possibility to run microservice, so stateless workloads, together with the, with the data um, workload. So, um, there's machine learning with TensorFlow, which did distributed TensorFlow, which is really nice. And you get a Cassandra, Kafka, a Spark. You can put all your um, stateful workloads on the same cluster to get the most of your resources. And then you get, like, uh, I show you. Um, so if you go to dcs.io, um, you get um, really good documentation and really good installation nodes. You can run a DCS cluster on your laptop. I would not recommend this because like, no one wants to run a Cassandra cluster on your laptop. Um, you can install this in the cloud uh, or on-premise. Uh, you can choose for CloudFormation templates, Google templates, or Azure templates. And if you go for the, for the Amazon ones, you just pick your favorite region and click on Launch. Um, I did this already um, a couple of hours ago. I want, it, it takes 50 minutes, so um, I, uh, maybe I will do this somewhere in the future. Actually, we, could, we can do this. Why not? Uh, so we're picking um, North Virginia, and then we get this shiny URL, and then we say, well, take my key, my live cluster, and you can choose how many agents you want. So. And then you can say, yeah, well, uh, yes, g go for it, install this. We will install on this month, maybe a little bit later, a Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so this is going to be installed. And in the meantime, I'm showing you like a real live cooking um, entertainer, like what I prepare for you. So when you log in to an existing DCS cluster, you see this. You see an aggregated view on your resources. So you see that my cluster has th so these CPU shares, roughly 100 gigabyte of memory and a terabyte of disk. I see no services running. And I see that all my not running services are healthy. And I see some internals of DCS. And they are all, all healthy. But if I would be an operator, I would not care about the number of nodes that I'm running. This is a detail. I'm running seven nodes. I only care about the node factor when some, some of the other numbers are odd. So if I have unhealthy applications, if I have a crazy high CPU utilization, and so on. So then I care about a node count. Usually I don't want to care about a node count. OK, so let's jump a little bit through this navigation. So everything what's under the service tab is Marathon, so it's container orchestration. So, and this is exactly the same as you saw in probably 100 Kubernetes um, demos as well. You can choose to run a single container, uh, a pod. Uh, you can give this um, application a name. You can choose if you want to use a Docker image. 
um, you don't need to use Docker images. So the Mesos containerizer or the Mesos runtime is doing containers like um, uh, change routes and C groups uh, since the very beginning. So what Mesos is doing when I just enter sleep 100 here, um, Mesos will wrap an on-the-fly container using uh, change root um, and C groups. And what's the third? C groups, change roots. What's, what's the namespaces? Thank you. Um, we'll wrap these three uh, concepts around my bash command, and we'll run it on a very on, on the random container. So let's do this. So uh, obviously, I got the instant sleepy application. So I, ca I can scale it. I can break it. Marathon will restart it. We can do distributed sleep with twenty. Oh, 200, uh, so with 20 sleepy applications, and you can look into all of those applications. So this is really the basic container orchestration uh, stuff. And we will look at this a little bit later. Everything I showed you can be done on the cron-based schedule. So you can define on the cron-based schedule that you want to run um, backups at 3 a.m. and then uh, a fancy um, number crunching job at 4 a.m., or you can define one-off jobs as formal description, and then you can trigger the ECS to run this job once and make sure that this is completed, um, this one run. Okay, and the last thing in the, in the today's demo interesting part of the navigation is the catalog. The catalog is kind of an app store for clusters, so you can install a Cassandra cluster with two clicks, or an Elasticsearch cluster uh, with just two clicks. This package is, is uh, quite interesting because when you install it, you get, or like when you click on it, you get a little bit more details of what's coming with this package. And this Elasticsearch package is an SDK-based scheduler, and by default it will spin up uh, three master nodes, two data nodes, and one coordinator node, and you can also add ingest nodes. So it's a really big Elasticsearch cluster. And you can, like it takes 10 gigabyte of memory, uh, a ton of disk, and just a little bit of C uh, CPU. But this scheduler is taking care of the business logic of scheduling Elasticsearch. So when you imagine you want to start Elasticsearch in, in, your, in, in Marathon, so you can do a, a proper Elasticsearch schedule, a proper Elasticsearch cluster in Marathon, let's say with 20 data nodes. So you have your data nodes, and you, by default you have a replication of three, so every piece of data is on three hosts. Imagine someone wants to scale down from 20 to two nodes. It's probably, maybe for some use cases, a reasonable idea. Probably it's a bad idea. Because when you instantly scale down from 20 to two, you lose 18 nodes. And the chance that all your data is on the three of the 18 shutdown nodes is really high if you do a, uh, a naive uh, approach on scheduling. So this scheduler will make sure that you, when you trigger from 20 to 2, that you will only drop one um, Elasticsearch node at a time so that the Elasticsearch cluster has time to re-replicate the data so you, that you don't lose data. And we will use Elasticsearch in our uh, demo, but this is a little bit too big for my cluster. Uh, so we're using a, a simpler approach. Like, uh, I, I could afford, well, I could afford 20 uh, gigabyte of uh, memory, but I probably I need the CPUs in my demo. We, we will we will see later. Okay, so <coughs> what we want to install now is Zeppelin. Zeppelin is basically a web notepad where I can paste Scala code, and this Scala code will be compiled to bytecode and will be poked against a proper Spark cluster. So we will do um, in-memory MapReduce. And you notice I just used two clicks to install the Spark cluster. Whoever did this by hand knows what pain this can be. Okay, um, furthermore, I want to install Neo4j. So I want to install a Neo4j cluster. I will install three node cluster. And again, I did this with two clicks. So Neo4j is also starting. Are we coming to Neo4j afterwards? Because I, so we're doing a demo about beer. 
and I want to see the connection between beers and styles and locations. So that's why I'm using a graph database. And the last thing I want to install for now from this uh, universe is Marathon LB. And here I need to tweak the configuration to use only one CPU because I don't have enough CPUs on this special uh, public node. I will talk about this a little bit later. So Marathon LB is an HA proxy, and this HA proxy configures automatically based on the running and healthy applications which are deployed to Marathon, like the container orchestrator. Okay, so we get all the fancy data applications running, but I didn't told you what great demo we are seeing. So there's a website, openbeerdb.com. And in this website, there's uh, 5,000 beers with a couple of hundred breweries. And they're, catalog catalog they're putting all the beers in the catalog, and so you can um, analyze your beer and get contact information for your famous brand, whatever. And you can download this as SQL um, data set. So there's, there's a GitHub repo describing all this stuff I'm, I'm talking to you today. And if you scroll down, you see this, uh, you see this SQL scheme. So you have uh, breweries with some meta information, and breweries produces beer. A beer has a style and a category. And a category is something like ale or lager. And the style is a more fine-grained art of category, so like German ale or... Um, hmm. Well, we, we, we need to check the styles. So this is the data set. And on top of that, we want to implement a beer of the day Java service. So this is a really stupid service, just connected to the database, getting one service out of the database, and display this to us in a, in a JSON form. So I want to deploy this application using the CLI. So we're doing DCS Marathon, because we want to deploy some containers. Group, because we want to deploy more containers than one. Uh, group, add, and then Marathon configuration JSON. I show you this configuration file in a second. But let's go to our DCS dashboard before. So we, now we see the beer group. And inside the beer group, we do have a database. I use the, like, actually, I don't know. It, it's, it's a SQL data store. I think it's MySQL. Then we do have Elasticsearch, Kimano, Logstash, because we want to centralize our logs. It's always a pretty good idea to, to have your logs somewhere searchable and centralized in this kind of highly moving environment parts. And we do have uh, two services, two Java services running. So while this is being deployed and downloading Docker, um, we will have a look at, at this configuration file. So this is pretty similar than what you know from Docker Compose. It's just not YAML, it's JSON. And this is our marathon configuration. So we have the group, the group is called Beer, and our first application is the database. I want to restrict my containers in the resource consumptions. I want to start one database. I want to have a port mapping. So I want my container to be exposed inside my cluster, so I'm using a bridge network. And I want to be exposed. So actually, I don't care about the host port. I don't care on which port my database is reachable on the physical node. I want that my container port 3306 is exposed. And I want that all the other services can find this port really easily. So I'm, calling, uh, I'm configuring a, a thing called virtual IP. So you can configure that whenever traffic on the combination database 3306 is occurring inside the cluster, this will be routed to this container port or whenever uh, traffic on 3306 IP um, style uh, names are occurred, this should also be routed to this container. I configure a health check. I will talk about health checks on the, the Java application. So this is the Java application. This is pretty similar to the data store. So we have an ID, our service has a name. It has dependencies. So our Java service should start first when the database is running and healthy, so passing the health checks. So actually, my database is able to receive traffic. 
and my Java service is depending on Blockstitch. So this is probably um, not the best idea uh, to depend on something like Blockstitch, but in this example, it works pretty good. So I also have um, resource um, requirements. So I want one CPU, two gigabytes of memories. I want to install two instances, and I have a health check. So what this means, I want to use the HTTP protocol calling this um, URL of my container, and I want to do this every two seconds. And if my container fails this health check, responding with something around 200, 10 times in a row, Marathon will stop this container and will restart it somewhere else in the cluster. In the assumption that maybe the next starter container will be healthy and will be able to uh, receive traffic. But the first time the container is not passing health check, it will be removed from a load balancing. So it's the first kind of healing process that we reduce pressure on this service. And maybe it recovers in these 10 um, health checks, and maybe not, maybe we need to replace it. Okay. My Java service also using Docker and a container image. Uh, like a, a Docker image and a bridge network, and I want to export port 8080. But now I want to expose it to the outer world. So we're using this Marathon LB thingy for that. So I need to add these labels for this. Like the HA proxy port, I want to export it to port 80, and I want it to be in the group external. I can define some upgrade strategy, and I can configure my database URL. So Here's the database, and here's the 3306. Unfortunately, you have some name suffix in the middle, but in general, here's the database I configured in my VIP, and here's the port I, I used. Okay. So, and I configured Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash, and Kibana in the same way, just for this demo. For production use case, I would probably go with a proper, uh, proper package, um, but this, this is really big and probably too big for my tiny cluster. Okay, if we go back to our DCS dashboard, we see that our services are running. So let's get some beer of the day. A bit bigger. Don't worry about the 4.3. I reduced the CPU count on, on my load balancer, so he's, for whatever reason, it's not really good in load balancing with just one CPU. Um, I really need to change this. Okay, so this is one of our beers and I added some meta information. I added the host address. Every service gets a UUID when it started, so when I reload, uh, you see that this should like, um, respond a different container. And this beer name is Signature Pale Ale, and it's an American-style Amber Red Ale. The term Pale Ale dates, no, this is too long to read. Um, oh, this is great. It's a heat trip sweet with uh, some tropical flavors. Uh, it's a be um, Belgian-style ale. This sounds really tasty with banana. Okay, Pro probably not my my kind of beer, but we, we get a bunch of beers. So um, uh, you see, this is load balance. I could scale this. I could state this via this CLI, DCS Marathon app, update, beer, service, instances equal, no, 20 is too much, maybe five. Um, this will be um, scaled up and then also include it in the load balancing once they get healthy, and so on, and so on. So I think so we, we can have a look at Kibana. So uh, I also added Kibana to this public node. So this IP is the special IP of my one public agent. So DCS has a concept of private and public agents. Everything is deployed by default on a private agent, so it's not available from the outside. But I installed um, this Marathon LB uh, package and Kibana on the public one so that I can access it from my laptop. So this is a really fresh installation. I need to click through the installation, and then I can discover. I need to make it smaller. And then we see some logs I just generated. And then you see um, things like meta information, like um, the UUID. So we can filter by, by UUID, and we see basically uh, quite a good round robin. So I don't know if you see that, but oops, it's too big. So these are our three nodes, and they're more or less equal, uh, so distributed uh, equally, uh, all the requests. 
Okay, but we're not here about, sure, you're here to talk about microservices, I'm here to talk about data. So, um, we actually, I need to install one more package, it's the Neo4j proxy. The same reason, um, as we installed Marathon LB, was that I'm not able to get the traffic within my cluster, because my laptop is not part of this private network on Amazon. So I need a proxy to, to, um, to get in there. So, um, so now we see that um, this application is currently in the state of staging. Staging and Docker images usually states that it's downloading the Docker image. So now it's now it's available. Okay, so we're using the same IP on the um, Neo4j port, and now we can log in our database. We need to uh, no, we don't need to configure something. So now we're inside the cluster, um, and what we now need to do is get our data from the SQL store to the graph store. And for this purpose, um, I wrote a migration. Uh, and I can add this migration with DCUS job at job configuration JSON. And this will create the job definition because I didn't add the schedule. And then I can say DCUS job run Neo4j migration. Oh. Probably the slash is too much. Oh, okay. It's fault to run. That's great. Um, now my uh, configuration is running. Uh, my ma migration is running. So the same as is true for containers, I can see all the logs of, of this migration. And this JSON file is really, really similar to the one that we saw for, um, for the marathon configuration. I'm just describing a job. I'm saying, hey, this is my Neo4j migration, this is my resource consumptions, this is my Docker image, and then I could configure restart strategies. Because when you're running a job, it's different from running a really long-running application, so maybe you are interested only in the results of this job if it's executed in 50 minutes or if it's executed until the next one starts. So you can um, configure uh, multiple run configurations so that only once run at a time or if it should stack up and, and stuff like this. So and now we're seeing that we already migrated the beers and yeah, this, this takes a while, so we will talk a little bit about, about why graphs are good. So who's, who's using a SQL data store in, in their company? So a lot of people using SQL data stores. Who's using joins in their applications? Okay, great, you have connected data. This is, this is really good. Who, who likes joins? Me not, no. Uh, uh, okay, I'm just kidding. So where graphs are really good at is in connected data. So do you know the Panama Papers? So where, where they uh, got, uh, I think, 12 and a half million documents leaked from this uh, Panama law company. And I think this is a really great example where you can see what, what, it, what is possible. So imagine you have a bank account. So I think everyone has a bank account. And every one of us has an address. So me has a connection to a bank account and to an address. And imagine someone else lives at the same address. So another entity pointing to the same address. And now this other person of the same address is officer of a company, and this company has a bank account in Panama. So this was the pattern they searched for in this 12 and a half million documents. And these are well, like eight entities, something. If you want to write down this in SQL, I pro probably no one did that, but, but this, would be, this would be cruel to, no, well, maybe, maybe it would be an amazing hack, but no one wants to do that. So if you're doing all these amazing connected data, you want to have this pattern and match your pattern against each of your data sets, and if your data set matches this pattern, you want to return it. And that's what we're doing now with our beer. Um, and hopefully our job is finished. Great, our migration finished. This is awesome. Okay, so now I can open the sidebar and can click on labels. So now I can click on beer, brewery, category, and style. And to get a better feeling of this, um, I want to show you in this uh, documentation what our model looks like now. So here. So 
we have beers, uh, breweries, and breweries produce beers. So <laughs> the color changed to a real example, but imagine the purple ones are the beers, and every beer has a category and a style, and the style belongs to a category. So this is a bit more feasible than when we have connections. So now ha let's have a look at our beers. So let's check the All Foghorn 2001 beer. And this is produced by the Anchor Brewery. Now, believe me, there's Anchor Brewery. And this brewery produces more beer, like the Porter one. And great, here we have the style Porter, the purple one, and the category Irish Ale. And when we now click on Irish Ale, we see a bunch of data and a bunch of beers belonging to this category. And when we now check some example queries I provided for you, we see, um, we see um, nice things. So if you're coming from the SQL world, you probably want to do something like this. Match breweries, staffed by breweries, where the relation produces to a beer with a has style to style, where the brewery is from Germany, and then um, count the number of beers produced and pair them with a style name. So, and then return this. So actually I wanted to aim for uh, the, the text representation of this. So, oops, it's the same query, here we go. Uh, but now we are returning not the style, but only the style name. So we're not returning the, um, the property. So you see that we in Germany produce a lot of Hefeweizen in this data set. Uh, we, we can go for the United States version. Uh, not that there's good beer in the States, but um, we do have a bigger data set over here. So in this data set, the most produced beer is pale ale, then lager, then um, red ale. Um, but what I wanted to show you here is, so you're used to have these kind of things, so these are joints. And if you're doing more things, you can uh, do uh, stuff like, where is it? This one again. So you can say something like this. You can say, I want to have a brewery which is connected with one or two hops to a style, and then I want to return it. And this is more or less the same, because in our data set, they don't have other um, relations. So this would be the same as fully writing all the relations, the, the full pattern. You can say, give me something that's within two hops. OK, so if I would be a data analyst, I would be interested in this connected data. But also, if I would be a data analyst, I would be interested in the description of the beers. I remember when we saw this uh, nice description of the beers. So for this purpose, we're using Zeppelin. So Zeppelin is Apache Spark. And imagine we're not having 4,500 beers. Imagine we have 20 million uh, kind of beers in our data set. So we really need a Spark cluster. Um, so then this MapReduce job probably makes sense. So the great thing about Zeppelin is you can pre-configure your demos. So basically, we have three sections here. The first section is load the SQL connector. The second step is run the job. Our job is word count. Are you familiar with the word count, hello world, map reduce example, where you go over all the words, and I'm going to press, uh, press the run button. You're going over all the words, and you're making tuples out of word and one and word and one in the map step, so you can highly parallelize those step. And in the reduce step, you do word one and word one, and reduce it to word two if the word is the same. So you do hop one and hop one to hop two. And again, you can highly parallelize uh, this workload as well. So this took 25 seconds in our, um, in our data set. And then you get a, like a SQL-like query language, and you can see that in our data set, the word with is the most used word, and then beer is the second most used word. So in a data set of 4,500 beers, we only see 1,000 occurrences of beer. I think this is a little bit weird, but anyways. And then this hops, malt, flavor, 
a brood from aroma pale finish malt's rich color style dark smooth wheat and light so if i would be a data analyst and if i would be asked what kind of words should i use to describe my beer i would say well pick one of the words the others use because readers are maybe used to these words to describe beers and don't use exotic exotic words like banana like like we saw in, in the first example okay so when we now go back to our DCS dashboard, we see that we have nearly 90% CPU utilized. It's not really consumed. This is reserved for applications. We did a also a really good job in utilizing memory, and we used only 5% of our disk. Everything is healthy except two tasks. This is probably the Spark ones. And if we now get back to like the last, maybe the last two slides, um, and then I think our time is over. If you have questions, I'm here all like most of the most of the remaining days. So please feel free to ask. Um, here's some links. Thank you very much, Lucas Art, for this great game. I don't have any copyrights on those. Uh, this is all done by Lucas Art. So just utilizing this for my uh, more or less good presentations. And look behind you. There's a free-headed monkey. Thank you very much. Thank you.